is my pleasure to introduce Zachariah Shervini. There he is. <laughs> it really is, is my pleasure. Um, Zachariah is an early childhood educator who ha has recently joined us here at McDonough. And um, prior to being here, um, he has had extensive experience as a teacher and as an administrator. So I'm just going to give you a little tiny glimpse. We met Zachariah. to share I think most is that he was the first pre-kindergarten teacher in the school's 80-year history. He taught at Beauvoir in, in Washington DC and he was the first pre-kindergarten teacher there ever. And I love that. Male. I just male. Male. <laughs> of course, of course. That was an important point. That was an important, yes, the first male pre-kindergarten teacher. But most importantly, since that time, we got to know Zachariah. And, and what I can tell you is that he is an amazing educator. He's a, a, a very strong communicator. He's a gifted public speaker. And he's just a wonderful human being. He's become such an important part of our team. And um, we're just so delighted that we have the opportunity to hear him speak this evening. Zachariah Shabini. Thank you. Well, okay. Have a mic. Um, thank you, Barbara. And uh, thank you, everyone, for showing up tonight. I know I see some familiar faces and some new faces as well. Uh, so that's uh, it's very nice for you to be able to share some of your evening with me. How am I doing on sound? Too loud? Not loud enough? It's fine. Great. Okay. So I want to share a story. About two and a half years ago, I was at my school in Mississippi, and I was speaking with a colleague uh, who was our school counselor, and she also had two students in our early childhood program, a student who was uh, in our threes class and then a kindergartner. It was around the fall, and she received uh, the fall report. The report card got sent home before she had a chance to, um, to speak with the teacher, so she had some questions about it, about the content, um, about what certain things meant. Um, and at, at the root of it was concern. I could sense concern in her voice. Now, I, w I was thinking of her as a colleague in that moment when I was even thinking of her as a parent uh, in that moment. And she's asking me about what, what they should do, what she and her husband should do to support her children's learning. And um, they, they both have advanced degrees. They both spend a lot of time with their kids outside of work. Their kids are interesting and uh, well-mannered, and they seem to be in fine shape. And as I was walking out the door, I said in a very offhanded manner, I'm sure you're doing all the right things to encourage learning. And she stopped me and she said, what do you mean by the right things to encourage learning? And it stopped me in my tracks, because so often I had worked with parents in the classroom, sitting across from them at the table or on the phone, and they're asking me, what can I do? What should I be doing? And often I would recommend something that would boost their academic performance. That was the question that I was hearing. But I think the real question is this. How can I encourage learning? I want to give you a little idea of what to expect this evening. This is interactive. I'm not going to have you sit and listen to me talk for an hour. Um, I'm going to give you the option, um, encouraged, to do some heavy lifting yourself. It is very much interactive either with me as a presenter or your neighbors. So, with that said, go ahead and introduce yourself to one or two people who are sitting next to you. for uh, 
uh, the rest of the evening, more or less. There will be a lot of discussion. I like to present my ideas as food for thought, which means that I try to present ideas in as neutral a way as I, I can to let you enter those ideas and concepts based on your own experience and based on your family context. That's very important to me. So here you'll see a lot of food for thought, kind of a take it or leave it. If, so, if you want to engage with something, great. If something's not speaking to you, um, I'm not going to force that. My goal also, I know that Munkdana is a diverse community. My, my hope is that with all um, presentations I, I may make that they are accessible to people from all backgrounds. Um, like anyone else, I, I have my own blind spots. Um, so while I, I think I may be doing um, this work in a way that is accessible to everyone, uh, if there's something that you have a question about, uh, talk to you afterward. I, I would love to know your, your perspective. And I know that Judy has feedback forms as well, so that may be an appropriate uh, place to mention that as well. Largely non-school. I may bring up school a couple of times, but this is largely the world outside of school. Uh, and you'll also be getting my perspective. I, I, I know maybe that goes without saying, but the way I see the world is very much based on my experiences. Um, the way any of us see the world is very much based on our experiences, and, and we'll, we'll dig into that in a little bit. So I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that I certainly have my own biases as I present these ideas. So you're also going to see some of this throughout. Uh, and this is a beautiful nature scene. I think it's Iceland, but I'm not sure. Um, this is going to give us opportunities to pause and breathe. So anytime you see this, it means take three deep breaths on your own. <laughs> You're also gonna see some blue slides. Anytime we have a blue slide, uh, it's, it's gonna encourage you to think a little deeper. That is definitely an interactive portion. I may ask some other questions throughout, but anytime you see blue, you know that is your signal that you're going to be thinking. Some of our thinking will happen um, with your partners who are sitting next to you. Some of it may be silent reflection. Uh, some of it may be uh, written reflection. Does everyone have something that they can write with, write on? And I think Jen um, has, has some extras, some uh, pads of paper and pens. So if you need uh, something to write with or something to write on, can you raise your hand and Jen will find you? something to reflect on for just a moment and then go ahead and do a turn and talk with your neighbor. What do you hope to get out of tonight's session? Go ahead. sense of our agenda uh, and what you can expect content-wise. So we'll do, uh, first part will be an orientation, so a lot of big picture ideas to help shape the conversation, followed by a section called How Learning Works. It's a shallow dive into theory, but I think um, helps uh, dive into some um, basic education theory that, that's helpful for our conversation. Pebbles and boulders, navigating the road ahead, and take a stance. Issues, and we'll dig into those a little bit later. Um, so the orientation and how learning works, I might uh, go through those a little quicker, uh, and then pebbles and boulders, uh, and especially take a stance issues are more um, of a workshop format. So I'm gonna have you dive a little bit uh, deeper into some of those topics. I think it's really important actually to find um, how, how I see it, how I'm presenting it, the concepts and ideas that I'm connecting to it. And this is a, uh, this is my definition. Just what stands out to you. Raise your hand. 
can call out. Any mention of school in particular? <laughs> no, but can you see how all of those phrases might relate and might help someone be successful in school? All right, so our orientation section, we're going to talk about worldview, what a worldview is, values, ghosts, spooky, uh, gardeners and carpenters, and the roles of parents. Worldview is a set of assumptions about the nature of the world that are used to guide the type of questions asked, hypotheses tested, and conclusions drawn. It's the way you see the world. Everyone has at least one. No matter how much we think they are, they are not objective. They do have some other qualities, though. They're based on a few things, the time, place, culture, and values of your upbringing. Go and take a minute or so and uh, give your neighbor a brief version of what this looks like for you, the time, place, culture, and values of your upbringing. We're gonna know each other very well by the end of this session. seconds. So I wasn't really able to hear specific details of people's conversation, just heard some good chatter, which is always a good sign. Uh, nonetheless, here's my response. And that's the point of the worldview. They're unique, they're contextualized. The way we look at the world, the assumptions we have about it, they very much belong to us. Our values. Uh, a few years ago, there was a uh, Israeli social theorist named Shalom Schwartz who did studies of all major cultures across the world. Um, the term major cultures isn't spec specified to my knowledge, so I think that can potentially be up for debate, but nonetheless, he did a study of all major cultures around the world and found that there are 10 universal values. So they're categorized by openness to change, self-enhancement, conservation, and self-transcendence. The closer values are along that continuum, the more related they are, the further they are, the more different they are. So I won't spend too much time here, but I will say this website down here, yourmorals.org, is fabulous. It takes about 20 or 25 minutes. There is a sign up required. I've never received any junk email from it, um, but they, I think they're in the hundreds of thousands. They, they collect data from, from all around the world. Um, to notice trends. Uh, and so I, I participated about three years ago. We had to do it for a grad school class. Uh, I did it about three years ago, and it clarified things for me. Uh, it, it, um, it helped me make sense of why I thought the way I did and how I approached the world. So I can, I'm, I'm happy to share with you that uh, my top three 
And usually they'll say out of these 10 values, there's four or five core values max. My top three are achievement. So I'm concerned with success and ambition. I say this with, with no pride or shame, just what, what the material is saying. Um, followed closely by benevolence, helpfulness, and actually this, this polarity of self-enhancement and self-transcendence for me took me a little while to wrap my mind around. Ultimately, I settled on, I'd like to do well so I can do good. That's a, sort of a, a mantra uh, in my mind. And then um, self-direction is important to me. So creativity and freedom. Um, I know that the writing is small here. Again, I, I don't want to spend too much time here, but I, I would urge you, if this is something that is of interest to you, go ahead and um, take that survey. Ghosts. I'll read, and then I'll ask you to do general reflection for about 10, actually, I won't read. I think the text is big enough. Go ahead. It gives me chills when I read it. Honestly, every time I read it. Um, and again, in the, in the spirit of food for thought, it's here if it speaks to you. Are you a gardener or a carpenter? So a few, uh, recently, I think within the past three or four years, a psychologist named Alison Gothnick out of uh, University of Cal Berkeley wrote a book on um, parenting, basically. And, and one of the points she mentions, and it's not a major point, but one of the points she mentions is that until very recently, the past few decades, maybe 40 years or so, there was no such term as parenting. There was parenthood, and you were a parent, but there was no such thing as parenting. So this idea of parenting is um, rather modern, uh, I think it also speaks to um, the comparative nature, potentially, of, of um, families. Uh, there, there's comparing in, um, in a positive way, I think, where you're just comparing notes and you're, you know, you want to know that you're not the only one who's struggling with something. Um, but then there's also the, well, my child does this and they're the top of this and, and all that. Uh, so I have a couple of pictures next to the book. Can someone tell me about what a gardener does. What does a gardener do? What is the nature of their work? Plants. They plant, yeah? Create an environment for the plants to grow. Yeah. Like soil and yeah. water. Yeah. Not a carpenter. What does a carpenter do? What is the nature of their work? Yes? And that is one of their more precision carpentry. Yeah, precision I think is a key word when it comes to carpentry. Not any old birdhouse will do. It has to be that exact birdhouse. How does that relate to parenting? Go and talk to your neighbor.
just going to be one of those spots where I'm going to push your thinking a little bit more. I'm going to start to push gradually over the course of um, our time together. Um, and where I'm going to push specifically is, invariably, when something like this comes up, people think, Anyone, th anyone think that as, as this was happening? So the question is not which one should you be. I want to reframe that. The question is when should you be one over the other? In the same way that you can imagine that a carpenter's approach to parenting can be problematic, you can also imagine if the pendulum swings the other way that that can be problematic. And I can share just from my classroom experience. Uh, I, I taught kindergarten the longest. When students stepped foot in my classroom, they knew the first six things they had to do every single time. I taught it on the first day of school. I reinforced it throughout the first few weeks every single time. If someone did something out of order, I'd have them start again. It's rigid, for sure, it's rigid. It is also equilibrium, that steadiness, that predictability. And they need that because I'm also pushing them really hard. So I'm both, in a classroom, I would both create rigidity and precision as a means of establishing, establishing equilibrium, predictability, comfort. Things that are predictable are rather comfortable. I don't want everything to be predictable and comfortable. But I knew that I was also creating spaces in that same day, in that same experience, where it's all my boundaries. I think you can see the edge of the gardening box there. There are still boundaries there, but the focus was more on freedom and unfold and bloom as you are. So both. All right, the roles of parenting, and I won't spend too long here. I'm, I'm mindful of our time. This, this presentation, this topic, in my mind, is ever-changing. So what makes a master parent? Ron Ferguson, out of uh, the Harvard Kennedy School, just published this book. I think I, I just read about it. I haven't read the book, but I just read about uh, the book three days ago. It had just come out. So it was so perfect that I thought to incorporate it into um, tonight's talk. Eight parenting roles. We'll go through them a little quickly. The early learning partner. This is the most important one, and I know many of you have children that have that are uh, that have already begun school. Some of you may have some younger ones at home. Uh, this is by far the, the most important of the roles, and this early lead effect is um, is interesting. It's very real. The early lead effect essentially refers to those kids who have had a strong early learning partner at home who are able to arrive to school, knowing how to solve their own problems, knowing some basic words. They don't have to be fluent readers, but knowing some uh, basic words. And basically what happens in a pre-K or a kindergarten classroom is, and this is very much an unconscious bias, teachers trend toward those brighter students or those, those students who are showing something exceptional um, about them. And that positive reinforcement leads that child to think, oh, I like this feeling. I like school. I think I'm going to do well here. There's a flight engineer making sure that the kids get what they need from school. The fixer doesn't want any big opportunities lost. We'll walk through a wall to make sure that their child gets what they need. The revealer. Philosopher, which, which Ferguson would say is arguably the second most important, making sense of the world. So when your three-year-old is asking you all those big, big philosophical questions, yes, sometimes it can get obnoxious, but you're also establishing meaning in the world for them. Model. Negotiator. And the GPS navigational voice. That's that voice that sticks with them long beyond they're out of your house. And if any of you want uh, this PowerPoint presentation, I am so happy to send that to you. If there's something that's interesting that you want to write down, please feel free to, but don't feel that you have to scribble all this. 
It's dynamic. It's really complex. What you do every single day is really complex. Some of these you might be attending to better than others. It makes you human. Exercise, and I'll give you about a minute or so. This written exercise is a way to um, distill understanding from what you just learned. And I'm going to try to have some regular thinking exercises throughout. This one is called I Used to Think, but now I think. It's challenging beliefs or challenging assumptions. I'll give you about a minute or so. Something you used to believe, but after that first section, maybe you think something different. Equilibrium and risk. Risk versus hazard, zone of proximal development, or ZPD, and motivation. I couldn't figure out where to put this neatly in any section, so I decided to just put it in bold and big. <laughs> <laughs> just really fundamental. <laughs> so John Dewey, who is a um, famous psychologist, educational theorist, um, no longer living, but was very inf influential in the field, uh, introduced the term to educational literature of equilibrium. Now I said I was using equilibrium earlier without having actually introduced it. Sorry about that. Um, equilibrium means that things are in balance, they are predictable, they are stable. Equilibrium is not where learning happens. You have to introduce risk to the equilibrium. The risk can be thought of as the disruption. Risk promotes disequilibrium. When you're in a state of disequilibrium, you're learning. And it's important in a number of ways. Because what we are asking of children in and out of school is so vast, and specifically in the Department of Risk, asks them to constantly, constantly go out of their comfort zone. An academic example? Perhaps an artist. You're painting the same schoolhouse or the same Roblox scene or Ninjago, you might get really good at that one thing, but you're not necessarily growing, you're not necessarily learning. Like a social risk. So many social risks that we ask of people, particularly as they grow older. This is scary. It can be really scary. And so much in the same way that I asked you to consider how being a carpenter and being a gardener can coexist. 
I would also ask you to just consider this question. Do you need to have some stability in order to make that learning worthwhile and sink in? If everything in your life is in a state of dis disequilibrium, it's chaos. If everything in your life is in a state of equilibrium, there's no learning happening. So again, my, my routines that I would ask my kids to do every single day, equilibrium, so that they wouldn't have to tax themselves mentally, energetically, on, on ordinary road to everyday things, because I knew I was gonna get them later. <laughs> And I just want to pause and acknowledge the difference between risk and hazard. They can be used interchangeably. In academic literature, there's a distinct difference. I do like that one. and risks. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And who can be? This is probably my favorite um, educational concept. One is allowed to have a favorite educational concept. It's this one because it is where you should always be targeting. If you want someone learning something, anything, you should be always you should always be targeting their zone of proximal development. That's what it is. So it's that difference between what one can do on their own and what they can do with just a little support. So you may have, all, uh, you may have heard the term scaffolding. Same thing, support. In the same way that that scaffolding allows this crew to do their work when they couldn't do the same thing if they were on the ground, so too can students move up a little more support, move up a little more support, and so on. As educators, we think a lot about how this applies to the school world, but I don't think it's really any different outside of school for any of us, adults included. There are things that we know how to do, it's just that as, as adults we actually have the option of opting out all the time from things that make us uncomfortable, from things that are um, in disequilibrium for us. Kids don't necessarily have that option, but that's not necessarily a bad thing either. I want to give you an example of what DPD might look like. I'm going to make sense of what you're, what you're looking at. So um, on, on the right is essentially a zoomed in version uh, of this here. But uh, the school that I worked at in DC, we, we worked with a mathematician uh, out of New York University, out of NYU. Um, and so this is a lot of her work, Kathy Bosner. Um, so this was specifically number sense addition and subtraction, really where kindergartners were. So this is the one that I'm, I'm most familiar with. There are some, no, one over here, there are some strategies that are rectangular, there are some concepts that are uh, modular, and then uh, models that children might use. So strategy, concept, model. And the idea here, and how it connects to ZPD, zone of proximal development, is if I want someone, or if I want to test, let's see, if someone has the concept of doubles, they need to have all of this, the things that are leading towards that in place. So the most important thing is supervising. And supervising essentially means that you can look at a number of objects and instantly tell how many are there. Babies are born with the ability to supervise. So the way that dice are, are designed, the way that children eventually don't count the number of, uh, of dots anymore, that's supervisation in pet work. But this is just an, an example of how these things build off of each other and you have to start with something very basic to then build on top of that. Motivation. So self-determination theory, some of you may be familiar with. It's pretty much the going theory in, uh, in motivation. It's been around for about 15, 20 years. It essentially says that for motivation to be in place, three things need to be satisfied. A person needs to feel a sense of autonomy, of competence, and relatedness. The relatedness really means relationships. It's happening within 
the context of relationship. And I've used this as you know, workshopping with teachers. If, if there is a, a student who just has some, some thorny behavior issues and we can't figure out what's going on, occasionally I'll take a step back. I'll just look at these three things. I'll post it on the board. We'll talk about it. We'll write some thoughts down. And if one of these things is compromised, and certainly if two of those things are compromised, it makes sense a lot more. Maybe this was for me more than you, I don't know. <laughs> so this was a, um, a tech piece that I had built in that in the interest of time, I we can skip the tech portion, but um, I'll, I'll ask you to consider to yourself silently for about 20, 25 seconds. And how learning works, which section or topic resonated the most with you? talk about a few things in this section. The task at hand, pebbles and boulders, so I will actually tell you what those are. Chores, developing children's voices. Oh, okay, that's it. The task at hand. This is basically your job. In a nutshell. It strikes me as so odd and preposterous in many ways. That when your child enters the world, they need you for everything. Everything. They can breathe on their own, but beyond that, they need you for everything. And then your job, if we all have to take a step back and think about it, your job is to make it so that they don't need you for anything. What a job you have cut out for you. That's monumental. To be able to do that and do it relatively well. There are definitely going to be mistakes along the way. Sometimes really big mistakes. That's normal. I'd also ask you to consider how you change over the course of your child rearing. Think about multiple kids, perhaps. How that changes you, how you might be a different parent at five for one than you are at five for another. So your child is, is the thing that matters most here in terms of how you craft your support, how you satisfy those different parenting roles. It's not the child you think you're supposed to have, you wish you had, the one your neighbor has. It's your child. So when I think of support, I think of it as a very fluid, dynamic process. It's not that at eight years old, your support, your support is supposed to look like this, and then at 10, it looks like this, and so on. I think of it like a mixing board like for professional sound engineers. And this one's interesting to me for, for a variety of reasons. First, there's movement, so I think it, it reinforces that idea that it is really dynamic, that things are constantly changing. But I also like that there are some that aren't moving at all. This might suggest that your support in that particular area is no longer needed and won't be needed. So I kind of think of this as like a master mixing board for the course of their lives. Sometimes things are going to be more active. Sometimes things will stay dormant. Sometimes things appear dormant, and then at a certain point, they become active. This is constantly moving. All right, pebbles and boulders, here we go. Uh, I'm a big fan of analogies, and I think of the process of child rearing a lot like driving a car. And most of the time, particularly when your kids are young, you're going to be driving the car. But sometimes, and ideally, in order to achieve that goal of independence over time, they're going to be driving the car. But who's with them? Who's with them? 
And your job in that situation is not to just let them drive the car wherever they want. It's when they're in that driver's seat, you need to help them distinguish between pebbles and boulders. Pebbles are bumps in the road. There are pebbles all over the road over the course of your life. Risks. Watch out for boulders. These are hazards. These are things that if your child is driving, you take the wheel. Big thing. So let's think of a two and a half year old, for instance, who's being asked to leave a party that they are really enjoying. What are they gonna do? Lose it. Why? Because they think that's a boulder. Just the worst thing that has ever happened to them. That's a boulder. Your job, over the course of time, is to help them see not only is it a pebble, but how do we handle pebbles? Take that same two and a half year old child trying to cross the street without an adult, doesn't realize what's coming around the corner. You grab them. You don't say, watch out. You don't say, be careful, you grab them. That is a boulder. Over the course of your kids' lives, there will be pebbles and boulders. Sometimes you are driving, sometimes your kid is driving. Ultimately, your kid will be the one who is driving. And you need to make sure that that GPS navigational voice that Ron Ferguson had identified, that eighth role of parenting, that that is telling them not only the right way to go, but what are the things to avoid, and how do I handle the bumps in the road? Pebbles or boulders. The world of chores, I see it like this. It's an opportunity to build self-efficacy. So if you want your kid to have a better handle on the steering wheel, as it were, give them opportunities to feel successful. It's that I can do this feeling, which for a kid, a young kid who is a natural helper, they're actively seeking out those opportunities. And this is kind of my motto. If they can do it, they should do it. It's that, real, that gradual release of responsibility that's really important. So I pulled up just a list of age-appropriate uh, chores for children from uh, Montessori. And if you know a little bit about Montessori, you know that there's um, a big em uh, emphasis, among other things, on um, everyday tasks and self-help and independence and, and things of that nature. Um, so I'll read just a few from, from each category. I suspect we have just about Age group, uh, every age group here represented. Um, so I'll read just a few and see how this resonates for you. So ages two to three, child should be able to throw trash away, carry firewood, fold washcloths, set the table. And I'm going to pause actually because I saw some, <laughs> I saw some reactions, which is always good. Um, more often than not, when parents choose or the caretaker chooses not to release a certain responsibility, like if this is your first time carrying firewood, parents don't do it often because it takes too much time and there's usually a spill or there's usually a mess. But that's a pebble. If kids don't have experience doing very simple tasks in a way that establishes self-efficacy and a way that helps them take over more of that responsibility that, that ultimately they'll need. And there's no magic switch where all of a sudden when you turn 18, you know how to do everything and you're a fully functioning adult. That doesn't, that's not real. It's small things over time. All right, so ages four and five, put away toys, make the bed, straighten the bedroom. Six to seven, empty the dishwasher, max clean the socks, weed the garden. Ages eight to nine, dust furniture, spray off patio, put groceries away. Ages 10 to 11, clean countertops, deep clean the kitchen, prepare a simple meal, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, ages 12 and up, uh, cook a complete dinner, bake bread or cake, do simple home repairs. <laughs> Suggestions. 
uh, developing children's voices. I'm going to uh, sort of take the more academic stance for a moment, and then I'll bring it all together. Any material that you read on language development for young children suggests that the more fluid, more robust conversation young children have with their caretakers, the greater cognitive development they have. More or less one for one like that. Um, oral language is something that sets the foundation for literacy. So actually when, when I have friends or family of young children or who are expecting, um, so like, what do you think I should do? You know, they're, they're looking for that leg up or whatever it is. I, I, don't want to overwhelm them, and I'll usually just say, love your kid unconditionally, and have a lot of opportunity for conversation. Uh, so it's not just any kind of conversation, but really open conversation, open-ended, what's known as serve and return. You might say, say a statement or two, and then ask them a question, and then it'll bounce it back to you, and you'll say, huh, that's interesting. Why do you think that? Serve and return. Or what, where, when, and who, really important for vocabulary and concepts. The why and how, really important for critical thinking. So again, I'm preaching balance throughout this. I'm going to preach balance. I'm going to preach some of this and some of that. Don't lean too much toward one or the other. And there are actually really great studies that show that memory, and that they did this work with uh, teenagers, memory is stronger of early uh, childhood experiences if parents at that age engage in open-ended conversation. And I won't bore you with the details, but that's the, that's the gist of it. Okay, so to bring it full circle to pebbles and boulders, having a strong voice gradually over time, because again, there's no switch that suggests that right now you're ready to have you know, mature and detailed conversation. It's developing children's voices over time sets the stage for democratic parenting, which is something that is regarded as pretty helpful in adolescence. And you can sort of build in opportunities before that, but when your kid reaches adolescence, and I know that some of you have adolescence right now, some of you uh, have kids who, who are um, who've grown out of that developmental stage, their main work in life is identity. They're trying to figure out who they are relative to their peers, relative to their family, their community, and pushing boundaries is a natural part of the work. That's what they're supposed to be doing. And so the more a child's voice is developed over time, the better they're going to be able to participate in that conversation. I'd like to go to the school dance. Tell me a little bit more about that, who's going to be there, what time, etc. Well, you can go, but only until 10 o'clock. Things of that, that's democratic parenting. It's, it's, a, little, it's a little give and take, um, which for, student, for, for children who are of that age and they're just trying to establish their place in the world, that kind of conversation can be very empowering for them individually and can be very strengthening for your relationship. Take a stance issues essentially are what they sound like. The world has changed in such a way that it no longer gives you the option to do things at your, at your own pace in certain regards. And so these are what I would call take a stance issues. And I'm just gonna go over a few, and this is gonna be the more like workshop portion of the night. So modeling is in modeling behavior. Race, yes, we're going there tonight. Sexual development, also going there briefly, and technology. And I identified these because the influences that shape your children's opinions and outlook are out there. And I don't mean that in a scary way. I basically just mean that if you don't take that first step, someone or someone or something else will. So by not acting, you are in fact acting. By not taking the opportunity, taking a stance on certain issues, you are bowing out of that conversation, but that conversation will be had, whether you are there or not. And my money is on you. 
frankly. If it, comes to, if it comes between you or the world, my money is on you doing a much better job. But a couple of do's, just general things to, to, to keep in mind when you're talking about complex issues. Be a coach. There's certainly a, a role for, for coaching um, in a parent's life. It's sort of like if someone comes off the field um, and the coach takes them to the side and says, like, what did you see out there? What were you thinking? Tell me about the decision that you made. Would you do it again? Why? It's that coaching mentality that can be helpful. Your reactions, sometimes the reactions as adults that we give are what the child remembers most. And so I, I urge you when, when it's a hot button, hot button or touchy or you feel yourself getting a little wound up, try as much as you can. Neutral tone. So this is one of my favorite phrases that I'll say if I'm talking with the child. Hmm, say more. And on the inside, my mind might be racing, but I don't want to let them see that. I just want them to tell me more about that. That's a neutral tone. Fix choices. Sometimes these big complex issues can be overwhelming. Would you like to talk about this or this? Would you like to talk about this now or after dinner? Fix choices. In the gray. And again, this is something that I've talked about a couple of times tonight. It's not either or. There is often a place for both. It's just deciding when and why. And I think just vulnerability is so core. Not letting me. All right. So mirror neuron is something I came across. About two years ago, some of you may have heard it, some of you may have heard it from before then. In the 80s and 90s, there was a group of Italian scientists um, who were doing work on primates. And long story short, they found that the same part of a primate's brain lights up when they do something as it does when they see someone do the same thing. So if I'm this monkey, <laughs> and I hold a banana, there's a certain area in my brain that lights up. If I'm this monkey, same monkey, and I see the scientist holding the banana, the same part of the brain lights up. And so the implication there is modeling. In a child's brain, seeing someone do something lights up the same part of their brain as them doing it themselves. So your kid watching you, it's like they're going through the motions themselves. I think something we all ask ourselves at times as educators, as parents is, what am I actually modeling? Certainly the things that you intend to model, what are the things that you're actually modeling? And there are a few, again, because I think we're gonna take a stance issues, there are, there are a few things that I would ask people to consider to intentionally model. shouldn't be taken for granted. These I think are pretty important. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll run across um, really risk-averse children. Sometimes it's nature, sometimes it's nurture, but really it's, it's often both. Seeing an adult, seeing a parent who they look up to so much, seeing them struggle with something, and sometimes it may just be in a very put-on fashion. Like, oh, I'm just not sure what to do. I'm having a really tough time, but I'm going to keep going. Sometimes even just narrating what you're doing can give your kid that they have to experience it themselves. If they see that thing happen, it's like it's happening in their own world. So just a, a few things to consider when you're thinking about what you want. Um, trying to make a decision between this activity or the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. So again, these are some uh, questions to consider. Thinking about race and the role that it has in your life, but really thinking about origin. So there's a list of uh, questions from the William Winter Institute for Racial Reconciliation based out of 
um, Oxford, Mississippi. All right. Here we go. Um, so I want to share about eight minutes worth of video. This is from Anderson Cooper 360. Uh, they did an investigative project uh, a few years ago. It was actually, um, they're recreating a study called the Dalton Study. And some of you may be familiar with this. It's, a, it's about how, well, I'll show you. Anderson Cooper, KC360, CNN Week Next 10 Eastern. There are lots of different colors for skin. I have questions for you about these pictures of different children. As I read the question, I want you to point to the picture that fits the story. Are children colorblind in America? Show me the smart child. Show me the mean child. Can you show me the dumb child? Show me the nice child. <laughs> is bias measurable even at an early age? Why is she the bad child? Because she's black, black. And why is he the ugly child? Because he, he does what he wants. Why is he the dumb child? Because she has dark brown skin. Why is she the bad child? Because she looks on everybody else's skin. How much do kids learn from what they see and hear from adults? Show me the child who has the skin color most adults like. And show me the child who has the skin color most adults don't like. These are questions that we, along with CNN, sold out O'Brien and a team of psychologists hired by CNN, spent months investigating through tests, interviews with children, and their parents. But they're questions that have been asked for decades. The first doll study ignited controversy in the 1940s, when psychologists Kenneth and Mimi Clark pioneered studies in the effects of segregation in schools by asking African-American kids to choose between black and white dolls. The so-called doll test found black kids overwhelmingly preferred white over black. Those results were at the center of the landmark 1954 Supreme Court case, Brown versus the Board of Education, that desegregated American schools. Now, with the first African-American president, and nearly 60 years after segregation was overturned, we wondered, where are we today? How do kids see differences in race? What we discovered might shock you, but first, how we got there. Skin color, child skin color. Okay, yeah. We asked renowned child psychologist and University of Chicago researcher, Dr. Margaret Beale Spencer, to design a pilot study for CNN and analyze the results. Our children are always near us, you know, uh, because we're a society, and what we put out there, kids report back. <laughs> when you ask the question, they'll give you the answer. Spencer's team tested more than 130 kids in eight schools with very different racial and economic demographics. Half of the schools were in the north, half in the south. Oh, oh nice The country is much more diverse today than in the 1940s. The children in this project are from two age groups and two races, white and black, to better allow comparison to the original doll study. Four and five-year-old children were asked a series of questions about these images. Nine and ten-year-old children were asked questions about the same images as well as this color bar chart. The test led us to three major findings. First, white children as a whole responded with a high rate of what researchers call white bias, identifying the color of their own skin with positive attributes and darker skin with negative attributes. Show me the dumb child. Dumb child. <laughs> okay, why is she the dumb child? Because she has black skin. Show me the mean child. Why is he the mean child? Brown. Show me the bad child. Why is he the bad child? Because he's black. Okay. Show me the ugly child. Why is he the ugly child? Because he's brown, black. Show me the child who has the skin color most adults like. And show me the child who has the skin color most adults don't like. Show me the child who has the skin color most children like. Show me the child who has the skin color most children don't like. Show me the child who has the skin color most girls want. Show me the child who has the skin color most girls don't want. The questions that got overwhelmingly white biased answers. Show me the dumb child. 
about 76% of the younger white children pointed to the two darkest skin tones. Show me the mean child. About 66% of the younger white children pointed to the two darkest skin tones. Show me the child who has the skin color most children don't like. Again, about 66% of the younger white children pointed to the two darkest skin tones. Show me the bad child. More than 59% of the older white children pointed to the two darkest skin tones. But some white children did have more race-neutral responses. So could you show me the good-looking child? So what are you thinking? I know you pointed to them all, but tell me what you're thinking. I'm thinking that I do not care if they're black, white, mixed, or any kind of race. I think that it matters who they really are. So, I'm going to ask you to take two deep breaths. <laughs> Come chat with your neighbor. Reactions. The next clip I'm going to show is a um, more brief version. Uh, it's a parent's reaction. Now, just for full context, they do ask many of the parents uh, who are a part of uh, the study or whose children was a part of the study. Um, so this is just one parent's reaction, but I, I did want to highlight it. So show me the smart child. OK, why is she the smart child? Okay. Show me the mean child. Okay. Why is she the mean child? Because she's good looking. Okay. Show me the good child. Why is she the good child? Because I think she looks like me. Okay. Show me the bad child. Why is she the bad child? Because she's a lot darker. Show me the ugly child. Why is she the ugly child? Because she's like um, a lot darker. What do you think? <laughs> Shopping to you? I just think it's because she's not exposed. I mean, you're almost in tears. Why? <laughs> How much upsetting. <laughs> What's upsetting? Um, it's not really upsetting. I mean, um, I mean, everything she said, she chose someone like her because she's smart, and she is. Um, All the good attributes. She's yeah. got a healthy ego. <laughs> that was like me. It would be. And as far as the one she chose for, uh, you know, being ugly or mean, I mean, you can't even see your facial features in that one. But she has never asked about any, you know, color as far as, I mean, she, she, when she plays with friends. Um, and when we were talking about we were actually going to soccer where there's all different kinds of people there and you know that's when when she chose she says i chose the dark dark one is the one that was mean i think that was an eye opener for me because we've never really talked about race so we talked a long time about it there's a certain earnestness i think in the children's reactions, all, all of them, their choices. There does not, to me at least, seem to be any maliciousness there. So I chose that one, I, I chose that last clip in particular because there's something so visceral about that mother's reaction. It's, it's shock, it's heartbreak, it's embarrassment, there's a lot there. I also chose it because that's what it looks like when the world does your job for you. On this particular topic, 
the mother, one of the mother's comments that uh, stood out to me was, I just think she hasn't been exposed. And the point is that she has. And this is simply an option, but again, if you don't have that conversation, and it's not a conversation, it's a continued conversation over time, the world will have it for you. And my money is on you every single time, every single time. that I have uh, planned more than we have time for. Um, so I will uh, go quickly through, through the last few sections, just in, in the interest of time. Um, sexuality de development is like any other form of development in a person's life. It is, it is innate to that person. It is part and parcel of being a human being. And as you think of that journey that you're, you and your child take together, toward eventual independence. It's hard to imagine potentially what that looks like, especially if you only have young children. Um, speaking very frankly, I think too often when sexual development is the topic, sex is the focus. Uh, and it's a part of it, for sure, but there's so many facets to sexual development. And, and the physical act of sex is, is a small part of it. So this question that I'm not going to force you to answer right now, but just to think about how will you prepare your children over time for the complexities of mature romantic relationships so that they can grow up to be a whole, happy, healthy human being. And likewise, these are conversations that happen over time. Um, so I'm going to just a tad. If you have kids in, and this is just my own sort of chunking of categories for age groups here at the lower school. If you have a kid who's in, in pre-K to second grade, it's a really nice broad category, bodies and boundaries. So specifically, um, anatomically correct body parts are the most recommended way to go when you are talking to your child uh, about their uh, about their body. Um, for young children, bath time is a very natural uh, time of day to discuss these things because children are naturally noticing all sorts of things. Um, and so I mean terms like vulva and penis and anus and scrotum and such. Um, but just as critical to bodies is boundaries. This idea that your body, that your, your child's body is their own, and that there are certain boundaries that other people are not allowed to cross. And it absolutely gets tricky when you think about the work that doctors or other families may need to do. It, there is definitely some, some tricky area there. But on the whole, and there is evidence to show that when children know anatomically correct body parts, the names for anatomically correct body parts, and have a strong sense of their own boundaries, they are less likely to be victims of child abuse. That's a very serious and very dark topic, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. And this is why, this is ultimately why. That's important. So your kid is getting a little older, and I capture that for only because that's a lower school grade. Um, but those changing bodies, changing in different ways. And, and I identify second here because you don't necessarily want to wait until the changes are happening. Always a good idea to just give them a heads up. <laughs> so that when it is in progress, when, when the changes actually do come, that's not when you're starting your conversation. You already have the dialogue going. This isn't an all the time thing. And if you, if you treat a lot of these conversations matter of factly, which is usually what younger children are asking you about, they're asking you about things in a very matter of fact way. And again, that, that neutral tone, 
can be really helpful. That can definitely be your friend. Being careful not to give away too much of how you really feel in your reaction, because sometimes that's what um, kids remember most. Not the content, but the reaction. If mom or dad or auntie or grandpa goes overboard on something, they might not know why, but they know that they just touched on something taboo. Keep the line of communication open. Um, I also want to, oh, and then early adolescence, that's everything else. And that's a scary proposition. Um, and I put the, the physical, social, and emotional implications uh, last on purpose because I think it really bakes into these conversations. Ah, there it is again. That's your chance for you as a parent to share your, your values on this topic. Very much touches on their yearning for a stronger sense of identity. That plays into it. And safety as well. Children who have more open, uh, more open and honest dialogue at home receive sexual education outside of the home are less likely to become pregnant, less likely to have STDs, and have fewer partners over the course of their lifetime. But that doesn't happen on its own. There's a lot of intention behind that. Um, a couple of resources I wanted to mention. We have uh, Debbie Rothman, who's actually local. She's a nationally recognized author and speaker. Um, this is a, and this is maybe particularly helpful if I do send you uh, the, um, the PowerPoint because the link is right here, but also if you just type that into Google, you'll, you'll find her work. Um, and then Birds, Bees, and Kids by uh, Amy Lang. Amy Lang is someone I met just on the independent school circuit scene at, at a conference, and um, I'm quite fond of her work. And, and quite fond of her approach. So I, I think there's some, some, you might find some different approaches there. So I, I would say find what com feels comfortable for you, whether it's if these two folks as a starting point or not. But these would be some good ones to check out first if you're having that conversation or thinking about having that conversation or wondering how you have that conversation. It's a good place to start. The last piece uh, is technology, and in the interest of time, I won't have you do the whole workshop version. Um, I was hoping to get to this, but um, ultimately won't. The most important thing I was going to say is, is just to have a plan as a family. Technology is ubiquitous. It is everywhere, and there are some real benefits behind it. There's some incredible learning opportunities that your children have that none of us had, simply because of the technology available. So. The question really in my mind is how do we leverage the advantages and strengths of the technology that we have now while mitigating the risks, all those risks that surround it. Um, and so having a plan as a family, not just something for your kids, but something for you to be mindful of as well. That modeling slide from earlier, I'd had tech usage there pretty purposefully because your kids notice what you are doing. And if it's fine for mom or dad to do, but not fine for me to do, on some level, they interpret that as hypocrisy. Now, certainly there are some things that adults can do that kids can't or, or kids shouldn't, um, but nonetheless. So if you do have this PowerPoint, or if you do want this PowerPoint later, just a few guiding questions as you consider what a family plan looks like. So who has what? Where is it stored and who regulates access? This topic of digital citizenship, and I have a resource um, later on, but how are kids interacting in these digital spaces? Weekdays versus weekends, what's your balance? Meal time? Do you have a strong stance on that? This would be a good time to develop one. Um, what are the entertainment alternatives? So often when I'm interacting with children who are, who are screened out, one of the most common pieces of feedback I hear is I'm bored. What an exciting world we live in. And to hear I'm bored. There's something about too much screen issues that just saps interest and saps energy. And I'm not saying get rid of it. I'm saying moderate. Think about what makes sense for your family. If you're going to put limits, is that daily? Is that weekly? If you have an older child, I would also say it might be a little interesting experience with democratic parenting. 
this idea here. You know, if you have a daily limit, that's one thing, half an hour every day. If you have a weekly limit, and leave it up to that kid. Just a side note. You, know, you get one and a half hours per week. You may use it whenever you'd like, except for one hour before bed. I feel like something like that. And see, and see what they do. Because if it's done cooperatively, if your child is in on that conversation, if they have developed their voice along the way, or are now starting to have those opportunities to develop those voices, they're going to participate in that conversation. And when there's buy-in, they're more likely to hold themselves accountable. And so I would also suggest thinking about a trial basis, too. If you're interested in the idea of a family plan for technology, inevitably what happens, particularly if you are looking to change behavior, is if that goes on too long and it's relatively unsuccessful, you basically go right back to your habits. And that's not the great. Again, it happens, but it's also not the greatest message to send to your kids. So what I would suggest to consider is just think of a trial basis and communicate that. We're going to do this for one week. We're going to do this for three days. We're going to do it for one day. And then at the end, let's have a conversation. Doesn't mean you need to continue with it. Doesn't mean you need to do something else afterward. But just a little food for thought. And if you're thinking seriously about something, when might you actually start? Common Sense Media is a really great tool. I didn't highlight any one particular page from it. Um, it's good in a, lot of, in a variety of areas. So Wait Until 8 is something that may be of interest to some people. There is a um, movement of families that are waiting until 8th grade to get their children smartphones. Not cell phones, but smartphones, because smartphones are supercomputers that allow you access to virtually anything in the world, which is very different than a communication tool for children and parents. And so while there isn't a large selection, there certainly are phones that just dial that don't have the smartphone capabilities. So if in the next few years you're starting to feel that, okay, I'm, I would be more comfortable if my child, if I had a way to get in touch with my child, or my child had a way to get in touch with me, that does not necessarily mean you have to get a smartphone. And so that, that wait until eighth is, um, is a movement, for lack of better words. It, it also just, it feels better when there are people supporting you, or when you know that there are other people who are going through the same thing, or when your kids say, yeah. There are a group of us that were fourth grade parents going into middle school last year that banded together. Okay. Okay, some people are measuring it each year, but it is if you're before you go into middle school, it's very helpful because the kids know who the other kids are and yeah. parents have all stuck together and they, we don't really even get many questions about it right now. Yeah. We have a pro here in the house if you have questions about that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you saw me look great. <laughs> <laughs> If I have one book recommendation, it's this one. I didn't want to overload you with, with different books here. Wendy Mogul is uh, someone who has her background in, I believe, psychiatry. And she was a practicing psychiatrist, psychologist, I don't recall, for many years, wasn't particularly religious, and found Judaism in a way that really spoke to her. And uh, this book uses teachings as a launch point for modern parenting. Uh, it also is very bite-sized in information, so if you feel like you can only read two or three pages at a time, but still want to get the complete idea, this is a good book for that. A lot of different subtopics uh, in there, and um, I think the ideas go beyond any one religion. Again, if I had one, one book recommendation, this would be it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give my thank yous. Uh,